The moment you start to set expectations with public shareholders about a P&L, we saw this with GE, you can say goodbye to massive business model innovation. It's not going to happen. The key thing, the key litmus test to look at on these sites to kind of see is it how open is the marketplace. But you want to see, you want to see a button that says, sell your stuff on our website. You don't see any buttons. But this would have been the place to me to experiment. Zorro is essentially a separate business unit owned and run by Granger. Granger is the leading industrial supply MRO distributor in what you call B2B distribution. Zorro on the on on Granger's last earnings call, um, the DG, the CEO of Granger, started to talk about uh, what Zorro is doing to expand its product catalog to you know try to embrace more marketplace type dynamics. The number that they said is they want to have they want to add 10 million SKUs. That's uh, stock keeping units. They want to add 10 million products to the product catalog, and the majority of those coming from third party sellers. Um, and they want to do that over the period of a three to five year period of time. If you remember, we were just reviewing Walmart's quarterly earnings, uh, I don't know, a week or two ago. And Doug, the CEO of Walmart, was saying that they've added 10 million SKUs in nine months, 9.5 million of which came from third party sellers. Only half a million of those came from Walmart's internal buying units, you know, buying inventory, putting it on balance sheet and reselling. Uh, and he it. was saying, too, that he thought that was slow and that the, a big priority for them in the months ahead is to actually speed that up and that they needed to grow that assortment in order to continue to scale yep. successfully. Now, now I've got a little clip here from the uh, Granger quarterly earning call, which I'm going to pull up. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Michael McGinn from Wells Fargo. Your line is now live. Thanks a lot for the time. Um, if I could switch gears to more of a long-term fundamental question regarding the endless assortment um, model. Endless assortment is what they refer to the Zorro business. It's kind of this endless aisle, right? It, it's a marketplace model. That's that e-commerce marketplace. That's that's what that's what this analyst is referring to. There was a distinct concerted effort on a red box versus what shows up in a blue box. I'm just wondering, Long term, what kind of thresholds are you putting on the third party market to m maintain branding? Are they going to get national account freight pricing? How does that feed into your supplier rebate discussions longer term? If you could just answer those quick questions, it'd be great. So, you know, our, we will have, as we build out the, the endless assortment, we will have partners that provide distinct oral branding, um, whether or not it's an Apple box or a label is, is um, probably up for discussion at this point still, but the idea is we will make sure we retain the Zora branding. Um, Zora will have more ownership for its own um, its own state. Uh, it will still leverage freight contracts that we have at Granger uh, and leverage some, some things at Granger, but in general it will be more independent. The value proposition will be independent and the business will be more independent. So you can hear there, right, that they are saying, um Granger is going to have its own, you know, its own uh, uh, Granger Zorro packaging for the products that they have in their own inventory. And then now they want to keep the experience the same blue box, red box. You kind of heard that a little bit. That's exactly this this article we were just talking about. Amazon has these kind of reassortment, repackaging facilities to change the boxing, keep the branding the same. Now, here's the interesting thing. Let's take a look at Zorro.com. The key thing, the key litmus test to look at on these sites to kind of see is it how open is the marketplace but you want to see you want to see a button that says sell your stuff on our website usually that button is at the bottom um i don't see it here uh or you know it could be at the top like come sell because because that because it's a two-sided marketplace. I need the buyers and I need the sellers. So you'd think, well, I should I should probably be advertising the seller side of my ecosystem uh, also on the buyer side. Sometimes you could have prosumers. You don't see any buttons. Um, and so the my assumption is that 
it, this is a some a concept we've spoken about many, 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 many times before on the show, which is the idea of complementary marketplaces. These are saying, hey, let's go do partnerships. You heard them talk about partners. And so when you have these more curated type of marketplaces, like Target is doing this, right? You're saying, I'm not going to open up my the core of my product catalog to third-party sellers. I'm going to try and go sell complementary stuff that some of my customers might want in addition to the stuff they're already coming to me to buy. But I'm not going to disrupt or invite essentially competition in on the core stuff I'm selling. Why, why do you use words like disruption or competition? Because these are linear businesses. Target is a linear business. Uh, Zorro is a linear business. Granger is a linear business. B2B distributors are linear businesses, which means they are resellers. They buy product and then they do some stock holding. They split it up into different, you know, they do uh, fulfillment and logistics. They might do some value added services and then they sell it to someone else. But that all that inventory is on their balance sheet. And so um, the marketplace model is saying, I have a bunch of internal buyers. The same stuff the internal buyers are buying and then reselling, and they need to make a margin for my business to be profitable. I'm now going to let other third-party sellers be able to undercut my internal buyers. And the reason why I don't think Zorro is going to be comfortable to invite in that essentially the prospect of being undercut by the third party sellers is because on this quarterly call, they spoke about, they being the executive team, um, they spoke about how uh, Zorro is profitable. They said Zorro is profitable and it's only going to become more profitable in Q1. The moment you start to set expectations with public shareholders about a P&L, we saw this with GE, you can say goodbye to massive business model innovation. It's not going to happen. When GE Digital started to make uh, have a, a P&L, make commitments that were being rolled up into the earnings of the business and presented to shareholders and analysts are judging the performance of the business based on those projections, that means you can't make these big drastic decisions that bring a lot of uncertainty with it, right? Um, are we going to have a lot of inventory? It's just sitting on our balance sheet because now we were just undercut by all these third party suppliers who are probably are a lot of our competition in our core business. It's a very big step to take. Here's why it's ab absolutely necessary is because you need a lot of demand. And so these these complementary marketplace partnership type of models, you don't see enough throughput to get the suppliers to play your game. And as a result of that, you see the targets of the world kind of do these big partnerships um, with other large retailers. Um, and that was this, this article that we were talking about here with Amazon, where Target is doing this. Um, it's a top-down approach. Yes. Basically. Not bottom-up. Explain not, that. What does that the mean? Top-down, the, what you see a lot of these curated marketplaces do is, let's go do a handful of partnerships with big companies because that's how we get a few initial SKUs, but that never scales. We saw Walmart tried this with the Walmart Marketplace. They launched that in 2009. What they called Walmart Marketplace was Walmart and about three partners. And it never really scaled with that approach because it was too hard to sign up and become a seller. Uh, what Target is doing is even more constrained than that. And there's a lot of these businesses that will basically do this. Where, oh, we'll get a few partners that will extend our assortment, but you're never going to get enough SKUs and enough breadth of your product catalog in there mm -hmm. and price competition to be able to compete with a true marketplace business. You miss the value by going this bottom uh, top down approach, bottom up, how marketplaces build is let's go out and get this fragmented supply. Let's start with the smaller and the mid sized sellers that would actually jump at the opportunity to get these new customers mm -hmm. and bring them in and let them compete with each other. And that's how we deliver the most value to the customer. I think mm -hmm. the challenge with these complementary marketplaces, they're basically solving a problem for the business, not for mm -hmm. the customer. The problem for the business is, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could sell more stuff to more people that we don't have ourselves? Mm -hmm. But you're not actually focusing on what is the value proposition for the customer and how am I going to deliver the most value to the customer, which is where marketplaces are. Most run. value to the customer and basically the most demand, right? If I have a bunch of customers going to my website right. and they want to buy a certain type of product, in this case, industrial supplies, and then you want to sell them complementary products, 
that's only going to apply to a small sliver of the customers. Right. It right? doesn't really move the needle in a major way. And so you might get some like top line throughput. You might be able to get 10 million SKUs over three to five years, which is not fast enough. Yep. But you're also not getting the economics if you make these large partnerships. Right. You need to go bottom up, as you were saying, build supply bottom up. That's where it's the hardest way to do it. You cut your teeth bottom up. Now you have leverage over the large retailers uh, or large suppliers, and they have to take your economic model, yep. which is which they're not going to take right. if, if you go to them first. If you're doing this top down model, you're making very little money on those third party sales compared to this bottom up approach where you set the standard terms, you know, what that take rate is, what you charge for various services. You build a thriving network around that with C smaller and mid-sized sellers. And then the big guys have to come play on your turf because that's where the demand is. And if yep. they want to go to customers. It's it's just it, it's a prioritization, right? It's like um it's like if it's like uh well, what was the handy competitor um that Home went Joy. out? Homejoy. Yep. It's like Homejoy saying, you know, we're gonna go to Europe and we're gonna expand to Europe. <laughs> um, when they've raised, I don't know, 30 or $50 million. And it's just, you're not ready to do it. You, what you got to do is prove the business model out in the core before you then expand into new adjacent territories. And so for Homejoy that's going to Europe, for, um, for uh, a Zorro or a Target, that's complementary marketplaces, right? Prove it out in the core. Now, okay, you say, all right, Alex, well, that's easy. How do I just prove that out in my core and disrupt my whole business? Now, this is this is why I don't think Ranger's trying to do this because they have this other site called Gamut. And Gamut, this is the current Gamut website. Basically, Gamut is gone. And on, <laughs> on this earnings call, they spoke about DG and, and the CEO and the team there spoke about how Gamut has, the learnings from Gamut have been rolled into Granger.com e-commerce experience. The beautiful thing about Gamut was that it's separate from the core business, just like how we've talked about Walmart Marketplace was way too close to Walmart.com or Walmart's right. core and business. Amazon Supply, the predecessor to Amazon Business Today, was actually a separate website initially Yep. Uh, that eventually got folded and then became Amazon Business. Yes, became Amazon Business. and But the key thing was that they were able to embrace this idea of opening up the core part of the business to third parties. Right. And that's not, and that is something that would have been perfect to do on Gamut. Hundred percent. To, to oh, hey, you know what? Gamut's a small property. It's a very kind of niche part of, uh, you know, customer audience that's coming to Gamut. How could I experiment with opening up MRO products to third-party sellers so on Gamut? Gamut is what I would call basically like a UX experiment. And, oh, and can we improve the, some of the technology? The search and the, and the search. It had nothing to do with UPIP, changing the business catalog, model, right? To fit online shopping in a way that actually makes sense. It was, it was, from my point of view, kind of an incremental innovation, not yes. really trying new stuff. But this would have been the place to me oh, yeah. to experiment where the, where the brand impact, the sales impact, no investors knew what Gamut was doing. It wasn't doing anything that material, but you could really experiment here and then try to bring those learnings, say, into a Zorro or maybe eventually into a Granger.com. But you try to open it up here and you see what works and what doesn't. You start bottom up here and there's less downside, essentially. Um, so anyway, pretty sure none of that happened. And um, that's why I'm, I'm just extremely skeptical uh, about even if now the good news is that Granger is talking about marketplace stuff. Now, challenge is how do you execute? And we've seen Walmart talk about marketplace stuff for 10 years now, actually longer. Walmart Marketplace launching in 2009. And guess what? They mess up the execution. Then they went to go buy Jet for $3 billion. Right. And they're getting the execution right today, but they're having to make a lot of investments and play a lot of catch up. The Granger folks are talking about marketplace finally. This is actually new. They weren't yep. talking about marketplace and opening things up. They, they had been basically openly denying marketplace for the yes. last couple of years. So now they're talking about marketplace, but they're not embracing it as in depth or aggressively as they should to say, how do we open up the core first? And then think about large partnerships, adjacent markets second, right? right? Because that stuff is, to me, it's more of a distraction. You got to start with the hard stuff first, prove it there. 
and then figure out how to expand. Hi, this is Alex from Winner Take All. Thanks for joining us. Hope you enjoyed the content. Feel free to leave a comment, ask us questions, and definitely make sure to join us on our next live stream.